In today's video, just out of the blue, I thought I'd try pairing a brand new RTX card with a 15 year old family PC. Now this right here is a £10 PC that I picked up off Facebook Marketplace a few weeks ago now, and this PC was sold to me as a gaming PC, but in reality is about a 10 to 15 year old family PC that someone had put a few upgrades in, namely a graphics card. There's a full video on the rather impressive little find if anyone's interested, but my question today is what happens if we take this series of upgrades that happened 10 years ago and further it a little bit with a brand new RTX card. I mean, what do you need? Will it even work? And what will the performance even be like? Now, the RTX 3050 is by no means a power-hungry graphics card, but compared to other entry-level graphics cards from around this era, and mostly the few years previous, it does use a tad more power than previous generations, usually requiring an 8-pin power connector. So just before removing the RTX card from my own computer, I jumped straight online to order a Molex to 8-pin converter. They're good for around 50-60 watts of load, and we've got 75 watts being drawn off the PCIe lane anyway. So the remaining power, if it even needs to use it, will be taken off the SATA lanes. Now, these Dells also came with decent FSP or Delta power supplies, so it's not really a concern with the power supply. It's just something that a lot of people have been querying with the release of the RTX 3050 and its higher power requirements. So I can confirm, with a few adapters, you shouldn't run into issues as long as you've got a decent OEM power supply. Most HPs, Dells and things like that do tend to come with decent power supplies. Just don't go trying to put this in a 1998 compact that had a best tech power supply that sends so much 12 volt ripple back on itself you can find forum threads about them exploding into fire. But anyway, that's besides the point. This one has already been replaced with some water damage so it shouldn't have too many issues powering an RTX card. So with that RTX fully installed, let's just have a quick refresher on the specifications of this computer. Featuring the legendary Core 2 Quad Q6600, this PC has received a few upgrades in the past. It was originally pushed up to 4GB of DDR2 RAM, of which I've been planning another future build video with this PC, so it now has 8GB of RAM, and includes the original Western Digital Velociraptor hard drive that the previous owner upgraded it to, something that was actually able to match near SSD speeds when I last used it. Originally it came with a HD5670, which performed admirably, but we're going to be replacing that as this is the entire point of the video. Now we are replacing this with the RTX 3050, which is a palette variant. It's a very small and very compact card with lots going on on the PCB, but ultimately it offers around R9 Fury performance with RTX. So it's actually a very, very capable and very powerful card in a very little package. But at least that's sort of, you know, the basic specs we're going to be working with today. Either way, with the specs all out of the way, we're going to be trying to test whatever will start on this thing. I'm going to be trying to push the latest and greatest titles from Red Dead Redemption 2 all the way through to Forza Horizon 5, because that makes sense to do on an old family PC that's been given a massive upgrade, and there's only one way to find out just how it performs, and that is of course, in the benchmarks. Starting us off with Red Dead Redemption 2, which required a workaround to even start. See, the anti-cheat for this game actually requires SSE, but as far as I know, the actual game itself doesn't. So once we've got SSE out of the way by removing the anti-cheat, completely making the game unplayable online, unless you feel like being banned, the performance was pretty poor. But it was admirable considering that these are relatively old specs and the game would occasionally, and very occasionally, hover around 30 FPS sometimes, mostly when nothing was going on. Thanks to DLSS we had the game running in a relatively low resolution with AI upscaling helping the game look a tad better. I know a lot of people were saying, oh if you increase the resolution it'll perform better. That's true in some instances, but in these newer titles where a lot of the effects scale with resolution, Intensive effects at high resolutions was a terrible idea, but still, the fact that we could see 30 FPS in some parts, already off to an impressive start. The latest release of Minecraft RTX was slow. It took a long time to load and I didn't think it was going to run well. However, once I'd lowered the settings, which took quite a while to do, 
In some simple scenes, we did actually see upwards of 40 FPS a lot of the time. In general though, this was thanks to it being based on the Windows variant of Minecraft, so the load was actually spread across all four of our available cores, leaving the RTX card to deal with, well, the RTX features. It looked good, it ran well enough, and was surprisingly playable once everything had loaded in. Once you had to load in some new chunks though, maybe you might want to look at actually a better system. Grand Theft Auto V saw a noticeable uplift in performance compared to the original HD 5670 that was in this system. We were still very limited by the CPU greatly, but with 8GB of RAM and an RTX card to carry through most of the textures and heavy lifting, it gave the CPU a tad more headroom compared to the ancient AMD counterpart, averaging anywhere between 40 to 60 FPS, and would only really dip below this when there was a lot going on. From online through to single player, results were pretty similar, with only heavy explosions causing intense frame drops. Something that can be put entirely down to blame on probably the DDR2 RAM in the system and the Core 2 Quad itself. BeamNG was actually playable with the lowest settings. I didn't expect the game to even run at all very well on a Core 2 Quad, but with some of the simple maps and some of the you know less busy environments, you can actually get away with playing it. Those more intensive and busier maps would of course cause the processor to chug and you know run at 100% utilization and the game was hardly playable, but once you'd actually accepted that some of the simple maps were the most you could do, 30 to 40 FPS was definitely achievable. Really, this made me want to push a Core 2 Quad to the very limits and test it against all of these modern titles, but that's going to have to be saved for a full-on Core 2 Quad video at some point. For now, I'm still pretty impressed by this performance. Quake 2 RTX actually ran really nicely in 720p, despite this machine being well under the system requirements. They actually recommend some more reasonable requirements with just a recent 64-bit processor. And it seems to be that it doesn't even have to be that recent, as these old, and I mean quite old at this point, 64-bit quad cores seem to handle RTX Quake with no issues whatsoever. Yes, there were frame drops, but I couldn't make my mind up if that was down to this being the most entry-level RTX card by NVIDIA, or possibly just due to it being a Core 2 Quad, or a combination of the two. Still, it ran really nicely, and given the, you know, relatively early PCIe standard we're using here, it was still quite nice. Now this one surprised me to no end. Greg Wallace's favourite MasterChef collection actually ran with the RTX card, and no issues at all really, there was the occasional frame drop down to, you know, 20ish FPS during heavy action, and loading into the next scene in of a map. But for most of the time, we were actually hovering between 50 to 60 FPS. Yes, I fully understand this is a remastered Xbox 360 game, so it's not a huge surprise that something that has similar processing power to the Xbox 360, with a beefed up graphics card, runs it this well. But given that this wasn't playable at all on the system previously, I'm actually quite impressed that just adding an RTX card allows even a recent title like this to be playable. I didn't expect much from Bannerlord in the slightest, as it can be a very intensive game, and, you know, it runs pretty harsh on some underspec systems. But in normal instances, that rang pretty true. It was hardly playable at all, the world map was slow and laggy, and most areas were just too hard for the processor to run. With a few tweaks to the INI file to ensure the game had the absolute minimal battle sizes, we did eke out around 30 FPS, which was just about playable. Really though, on a system like this, you go back to the previous title, Warband, you will be hardly seeing a single frame dropped when you lock the frame rate to 60 FPS. So ideally, on some of these new, sort of indie, not as well optimized titles, you are going to have to stick to the classic releases rather than the latest and greatest, even with an RTX card. Then to round us off with, we had Forza Horizon 5, which didn't work at all, even with SSE workarounds. And there's a lot of tweaks that people recommend, and lots of dodgy YouTube videos out there claiming you can get playable performance on your old family PC with a Q6600 or a Core 2 Duo, just download these files. And I can safely say that you should never touch any of them. There seems to be no way at all to get this game working well on a Core 2 Quad, yet alone seeing playable frame rates. The most I managed to get the game to do was to launch occasionally, but you could never make it in-game, and sometimes it would lock up the entire system. This game is an example of where the Core 2 Quad is very limited. Workarounds might work on things like Red Dead 2 with limitations, but you want the latest and greatest RTX enabled titles, they're going to start throwing up errors and they won't want to work. 
So just be wary of those videos saying they can, when someone like me is going to tell you very distinctively they aren't going to run at all. Then again, if a fix comes out and it does work, I'll be very impressed. But at that stage, I'd probably be covering it myself. I didn't want to stop the benchmarks just there, so I did go through and compare this RTX uplift to the original graphics card in the system, with original benchmarks with 4 gigs and then upgraded to 8 gigs, and then of course adding the RTX card. Performance in general did see a pretty stark increase, with frame rates often being smoother all across the board. There were a few instances where the Radeon actually managed to achieve a higher average, but frame times were so dire in the end that really, it was a much worse experience. We were always CPU bound with the RTX card, something that also wasn't the case on the older Radeon where they were pretty well matched together, and in this situation we've really given ourselves a huge bottleneck. No one should be pairing an RTX 3050 with an old Core 2 Quad. But does it actually give you an increase in performance? Well, surprisingly, yes. So in conclusion, should you go out and buy an RTX card for your old family PC? Of course not. But does it actually show how well this level of RTX performance scales down to these older systems? Yes, it shows that the GPU is actually capable of taking the brunt of modern games on thanks to DLSS and those ray tracing cores increasing utilization to give you a degree of parity with, you know, the Q6600's usage in these cases. For now, I want to actually go ahead and test the Core 2 Quad to its limits, but this was actually a little bit of an eye-opener that maybe the Core 2 Quad is not as dead as I first thought. Either way, I'm very excited to actually get this old Marketplace PC a real set of upgrades which will be on the way in a future video, but until then, thank you very much for watching, and good night.